and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 179, Flashback, The Battle of the Atlantic Begins. So few things bring about change as war. The victors of the last battle may hesitate to change anything, after all, they won, but the losers are more open to finding ways to make sure they are not defeated again, and there will be a next time. There always is. The sea battles of the Second World War would see massive changes in technology, but also in the size and sheer scope of the killing machines. Before and even at the beginning of World War II, naval strength was still defined by many, by most, by those that mattered, by the battleship. And that the coming battles of those dreadnoughts on the high seas would determine victory, as they always had before. At the beginning of the war, aircraft carriers and submarines were viewed as nothing more than auxiliaries or extensions of the mighty battleships, there to assist but nothing more. By the time the war was over, those carriers and submarines would replace the battleships as the Navy's main weapons. A dramatic shift, to be sure, for those in various naval uniforms, but such is the way with large entities, such as militaries. Just before dawn on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Great Britain and France had already warned Hitler that should Poland be attacked by Germany, they would assist the beleaguered country. Yet, der Fuhrer was ready for that. His plan was to smash Poland's defenses within a matter of weeks before her shocked allies could move any forces to assist and then offer them a negotiated peace treaty. By now, Hitler believed he could put himself in Chamberlain's place and divine what the man thought, and he had been right up to this point. The British and French told Berlin that they needed an answer by 11 a.m. of September 3rd to their ultimatum that German forces vacate Poland, or a state of war would exist between them. No response came from Germany by the time of the deadline. As such, the nations were at war. Yet as for the British and Germans, whose navies had tangled during the First World War, Both sides had already moved pieces into place to ready themselves for the potential coming naval battles. And really, the War of the Atlantic and other nearby bodies of water would be nothing more than a continuation of the First World War, as if a giant pause button had been pressed and then released. Of course, now the machines of war were much larger and much more deadly. On October 3rd, about 250 miles, or 402 kilometers, northwest of Ireland, the German U-boat 30, captained by Oberlieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp, was on patrol, already looking for its first victim. It was 5.30 p.m. local time, and Lemp's Nazi Germany had been at war with the French and British for just a few hours. The 26-year-old wanted to make his mark and hurt the enemy. As such, the U-30's four bow torpedo tubes were ready. But though normally the North Atlantic shipping lanes were alive with activity, Lemp could see nothing around him at the moment. This was actually the 16th day of U-30's deployment. Earlier, the U-30, along with 15 other submarines, had quietly slipped out of German ports to be ready for any reaction the British might give after Poland was invaded. And since the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, especially in the form of Grand Admiral Erich Rader, decided the best way to threaten Britain was to once again launch a war of attrition, his submarines were ready to sink the vessels that brought supplies and food to Britain and France. Now operating within his station, Lemp, as ordered, avoided being detected by only surfacing during darkness which meant, while underwater, the sub used batteries for propulsion and then switched to its diesel engine while on the surface, allowing the batteries to be recharged. Ironically, though Poland would be out of the war soon enough, Germany's U-boats might still find themselves engaging Polish vessels. B-29 
before Germany invaded, and Poland, like everyone else, knew that Germany's eastern neighbor was next on Hitler's list. Warsaw had ordered its three most modern destroyers to sail for Britain, to keep them out of German hands. The Poles knew they could not win in a fight with Germany. Still, the last piece of Polish land to be taken by the Germans was not Warsaw, but the naval base at Heel. It did not surrender until October 1st, 1939, four days after the capital capitulated. Back to U-30. Just as the sun was going down, Lemp spied smoke to his east. It had to be a ship. Patiently watching to his east, soon the form of a vessel came to him. It was large, doing about 15 knots, but most importantly, it was blacked out and zigzagging. Why would a passenger ship do all that? It had to be an armed merchant cruiser. As Hitler's Germany was, for now, observing the German Naval Prize Law and the London Submarine Treaty, Lemp could not simply fire on the ship. If he had been sure it was an armed merchant cruiser, or if it had been part of a convoy, as opposed to just a merchant ship, then he could have fired without warning. But the law said he had to figure out what was coming at him first. This meant the ship had to be boarded and searched. If war material was found, he could then sink it, after allowing the passengers time to get to the lifeboats. Of course, all this negated the advantages of using submarines. Still, the treaties had been explicit. The rules had to be observed. After all, to Hitler's thinking, Poland would be conquered, then peace offered up to Britain and France, before they could really have a chance to respond. And the Americans, they were to be left alone, for now. Unrestricted submarine warfare had brought them into the last war. No, the U.S. would be left alone, until all of Europe was under the domination of Berlin and Rome. But instead, it seems, of having Hitler's words ringing in his head, Lemp seemed to be focusing on the instructions from Commodore Karl Donitz, flag officer commanding U-boats. Just before U-30 set out, the flag officer warned that the British would have armed passenger liners, and to be wary. Lemp would not take any chances. He yelled out, having made up his mind, "'Clear the bridge for dive!' After the hatch was secured, the air was forced out of the ballast tanks, replaced by seawater. Yet as the U-30 went under, the hydroplane operators held the vessel at periscope depth. Lemp used the periscope to guide the sub closer to the approaching blacked-out ship. The bearing and range were taken, factored in. Then Lemp yelled, Tube 1, fire! Three more torpedoes followed. Ignorant of all this was the 13,000-ton ocean liner Athenia. Right before the war, the passenger ship had left Glasgow. On board were 1,417 passengers, mostly women and children, of which 311 were Americans. Of the four torpedoes, one of them struck the ship on its port side, just behind its middle. Water started rushing in. The Athenia sank that evening, and 112 lives were lost, of which 85 were women and children, and of them, 22 were Americans. That nation's press and citizenry screamed foul, and their roast talk of the sinking of the Lusitania back in 1915 that helped bring the U.S. into World War I. Back in Germany, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister, put out a statement that said, It was the British who sunk the civilian ship to turn America against Germany. When Lemp's sub came back home the next month, having kept radio silence, he admitted to the authorities that it was him, against orders, who had fired the torpedoes. The German naval high command moved to swear the sub's crew to secrecy and switched out the ship's logs to falsify that U-30 was actually... 200 miles away, when the Athenia went down. The entire story did not come out until the Nuremberg war crimes trials, after Germany surrendered. 
On the same day that the Athenia was sunk, Winston Churchill, the newly appointed first Sea Lord of the Admiralty, was in the Admiralty's boardroom discussing tactics and strategy with the Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Dudley Pound. It was the job of Sir Dudley and his staff to bring Churchill up to date, only being in the position since September 1st, the day Germany invaded Poland. Churchill, being Churchill, bombarded his staff, much like the Germans were currently bombing Poland, with questions. Within days, his requests for information became known as the daily prayers, as each started with, Pray, inform me, on one sheet of paper, why? Later, Churchill would write, Unable not to mix war with high drama. Once again, defense of the rights of a weak state, outraged and invaded by unprovoked aggression, forced us to draw the sword. Once again, we must fight for life and honor against all the might and fury of the valiant, disciplined, and ruthless German race. Once again, so be it. And it was that, once again, that could have easily and accurately served as a theme for the upcoming naval battles. Because there had only passed 21 years between the end of the Great War and the beginning of this next World War, many of the ships for Britain would serve in both conflicts, so too would many of its sailors. But more than that, both countries would fight on the seas with the same ends in mind. As Britain was an island nation, Germany hoped to sever most of its 40 million tons of cargo and oil it received each year. In fact, 90% of its oil came from across the Atlantic, from the U.S., Venezuela, and Trinidad. Never mind the mighty British Empire with its tentacles stretching throughout the world. If the home island could be starved, made weak, and then brought to its knees, the contest would be over. Of course, as the British Empire had some 2,000 ships on the high seas at any given time, the German Navy would be stretched indeed to pull us off. Yet it had almost worked during the Great War. But that was when Germany's Navy had been second only to Great Britain's. In 1939, Germany's naval forces were merely a shadow of its former self. And given Germany's relative capacity to build ships at the rate Britain did, the smart plan would have been to produce mostly submarines. They had but all strangled the island nation during the earlier war. But Hitler, upon coming to power, focused what little attention he gave naval matters to surface power. Ironically, Great Britain, though almost starved to death by German submarines, did little in the way of developing anti-submarine tactics between the wars. This is partially explained by the various naval treaties and relative national poverty after the Great Depression, but certainly factored in was the idea, this current way won us the war last time, it will again, next time. Yet it was the German Navy that had suffered after the Great War. Ordered to be destroyed when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, the German sailors on board defied the Allies by scuttling their ships a week before the signing, while being held at Scapa Flow just north of Scotland, and there were many German vessels sunk that day. The one major naval clash during the war was the Battle of Jutland in May 1916. The British lost more ships than the Germans. However, the latter, never afterward, came out to challenge the British Royal Navy. But Berlin was not giving up. Instead of risking their capital ships, Germany would approve unrestricted submarine warfare. It was an almost instant game-changer. When the U.S. entered the war in April 1917, German subs would sink 881,000 tons of shipping. This left Britain with a three-week supply of grain and forced food rationing. It was only the Royal Navy's change on its position to accept the convoy system that kept the island nation from starving and being forced out of the war. With the Great War over and the German Navy scuttled, many expected a return to normalcy, to peace. But that's not what happened. 
As the U.S. Merchant Marine had vastly increased during the war, the U.S. Navy demanded enough ships to protect it. This would challenge Britain's established dominance of the high seas. And though both had been allies, wars are started because of such things. Also, both the U.S. and Britain had become nervous because of Japan's naval expansion during the Great War. The U.S. was worried about Japan's grabbing of the Marshall Island Group, which threatened communications between Hawaii and the Philippines. As for the British, with Japan's navy increasing, they basically had to worry about those parts of their empire east of the Suez Canal. But all this talk of a naval arms race greatly upset the civilians of the affected countries. And on this occasion, the politicians' will to oppose the voters collapsed. As such, talks began between the U.S. and Great Britain to work out a deal. In essence, the two would have a parity with their navies, a true sign of how Britain's sea power had fallen and that of the United States had risen. The Washington Treaty called for not only scrapping many vessels, along with limiting the building of carriers, something relatively new, but that no capital ships would be built for 10 years. After that time, anything built would be limited to 16-inch guns and a displacement of 35,000 tons of water. Then the London Naval Treaty of 1930 extended the battleship's moratorium until 1936. The onset of the Great Depression did the rest in limiting new naval construction. More besides, what funds Britain had for the Royal Navy went to the construction of a massive naval base at Singapore. No one said this outright, but the Far East base was to serve as a check on any aggression considered by Japan. Japan duly took notice of this. When the extension of not building capital ships ended in 1936 and seemed about to be renewed, Japan announced to the world it would be pulling out of such negotiations. Having come so far, so fast, since forced to trade with the world by the Americans, the Japanese had also learned the lesson of gunboat diplomacy. A country did not have to actively occupy a target country in order to control it anymore. With enough ships, any country could be brought to its knees. Tokyo let it be known that they were tired of the 5-5-3 ratio of naval power. That is, for every five ships for the U.S. and Britain, they were allowed to have three. To their way of thinking, this time of Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce, Ford was over. Japan was determined to become the dominant power in the area, just as the U.S. had in the Americas and the U.K. had on the oceans and in many parts of the world. It was simply Japan's time in the sun. Of course, the U.S. and Britain couldn't exactly know what Japan intended, but we now know that Tokyo started working on the largest battleships in the world, the 72,000-ton Yamato and the Musashi. Both would have nine 18.1-inch guns. With Japan backing out of the deal, both the U.S. and Britain started their own naval projects. London started with five battleships, but nothing near what Japan had planned. These new vessels would be of the King George V class, displacing 35,000 tons and having 10 14-inch guns. The U.S. started on two 35,000-ton ships, the North Carolina and the Washington, which would have nine 16-inch guns. When the war came to Europe, Britain only had... 15 battleships and battlecruisers. And except for the Nelson and Rodney, they had all seen action at Jutland or were under construction during the Great War. Which meant these ships were not up to date on submarine countermeasures, nor equipped with anti-air defenses. As for the French, they had seven capital ships, but most times five of them had to stay in the Mediterranean to keep an eye on Mussolini's Italy. It was Great Britain that pioneered the development of the aircraft carrier, a novel idea to be sure, yet the same 
could not be said for the planes stationed on the carriers. When war came in 1939, the United Kingdom had six carriers, but the planes on board were obsolete and viewed as mostly good for patrols. The full potential of the carriers had not yet been discovered. When Churchill once again took over the Admiralty, his country only had 184 destroyers, the vessels slated to chase down subs. Yet their only weapon was the depth charge, a bomb designed to explode underwater at a selected depth. Its range was a meager seven yards, which meant that luck was to be the key factor in killing a German sub. After the Great War, Germany was allowed to have very little in the way of a navy. No battleships, nothing over 10,000 tons, no carriers, and certainly no submarines. In reaction to the restrictions of the Versailles Treaty, Berlin approved the design and construction of what would be known as pocket battleships. The first three built were the Deutschland, the Admiral Graf Spee, and Admiral Scheer. Technically, they were long-range commerce raiders. They only had six 11-inch guns or 5.9-inch guns. However, that meant that if they couldn't win a fight, they could run away with their 26-knot speed. As for the submarines, though Germany could not build them, they could design and improve sub blueprints. And that's exactly what they did. Starting in 1922, just years after the end of the war in Europe, an office was set up in The Hague, supposedly a Dutch company, that designed subs for other countries. By 1928, German workers were getting hands-on experience by building a 750-ton U-boat in Spain. As with most crimes, where there's a will, there's a way. And Berlin, not to mention the German armaments family Krupp, were not about to allow the shameful treatment of their country to go on any longer than possible. Just before Hitler came to power, Berlin, daring the other nations, openly ordered the construction of 16 relatively small submarines. As stated previously, Hitler was much like Napoleon when it came to military might. His mind bent towards land armies that could strike at Germany's traditional enemies, France and Soviet Russia. Hitler had never believed it was possible or wise to take Britain on, on the high seas. Why waste those resources? Once the heartland of Europe was under the Nazi flag, all those boats could just sail around, unable to recapture lost territory. As for the United States and Britain, and Hitler really did admire slash loathe the British, they would just have to find a way to come to grips with a German-controlled Europe. Such were the German leaders' plans. And because Hitler could not see his Germany having a naval war with Britain, nor imagining that country not accepting reality once Germany held sway over Europe, he gladly signed a navy treaty with Great Britain in 1935. Germany would never challenge Britain's naval strength. In exchange, Germany was once again allowed to build a fleet. A short time later, Hitler also signed a treaty stipulating that Germany would never again resort to unrestricted submarine warfare. These two documents seemed to have put London to sleep to any possible danger from German naval forces. Besides which, Britain was counting on the ASDIC system for dealing with German subs. ASDIC, or as it was known in the U.S., sonar, sent out sound waves, which, when bounced off of objects like a sub, would come back and give the listener the distance of an underwater object. That the system had a long way to go before truly being effective was ignored by London. The upside for Berlin was that the two treaties allowed them practically unlimited naval construction. No matter how much they built, it would never come close to what Britain possessed. And that was what Hitler had been after all along. Soon, the two 32,500-ton battlecruisers Schornhurst and Gneisenau were being constructed. Then came the battleships 
Bismarck, of 50,900 tons, and the Tirpitz, of 52,600 tons. But London didn't blink. Then followed by Germany, two heavy cruisers, 16 destroyers, and 28 submarines, all still within the new treaties. As the invasion of Poland came closer, Hitler ordered a navy buildup, but continuously told his admirals that there would be no war with Britain. And he was right to be so confident, to a degree. For years, he had been confusing his adversaries and getting what he wanted. It would be the same with Poland. As had happened during other moments of international crises, the German Navy had the Deutschland, the Admiral Graf Spee, and all available subs put to sea, just in case. But nothing ever came of it. Peace was always maintained, as Hitler had bluffed and bullied his way through a series of land grabs. It would be the same for September 1939. But three days later, submarine commander Donitz was handed an intercepted copy of a British signal sent to the entire fleet. It simply read, Total Germany. Peculiarly British in its brevity, it was a message of total war with an old adversary. Hitler had been wrong this latest time, but it would be his sailors that would pay the price. As war came, Nazi Germany had two battlecruisers, three pocket battleships, 34 destroyers and torpedo boats, and 57 submarines, and those were mostly the unchanged models from World War I. Together, to combat this, Britain and France had 22 battleships, 7 carriers, 22 heavy cruisers, 61 light cruisers, 255 destroyers, and 135 submarines. Grand Admiral Reeder would write of this time, As far as the Kriegsmarine is concerned, it is obvious that it is not remotely ready for the titanic struggle. The only course open is to show it knows how to die gallantly. After Poland was digested by Germany and the USSR, Europe stumbled into the phony war. Germany was gearing up to invade France, while London was hesitant to start an air war that would see the Luftwaffe retaliate against British citizens. But that's not how it played out on the high seas. The British Royal Navy, right away, blocked German vessels from leaving the North Sea with its cruiser patrols. The larger British ships gathered at Scapa Flow to the north, not only to keep them safe, but to be ready to check the larger German vessels in case they ventured out. To counter this, Reeder had already decided the German Navy would be much more aggressive than it had been in the last World War. His U-boats, pocket battleships, and cruisers would engage the British merchantmen on their sea routes, which would, hopefully, force the British Navy into pulling some of its vessels from the North Sea for escorting duty. This would give the larger German vessels a chance to reach the Atlantic and wreak havoc. By now, Reeder had the measure of his Fuhrer. If the German Navy could show success early on, the land-focused leader might allocate more resources for U-boats, which would allow Reeder to truly attempt to starve the British Isle. The speed of Poland's collapse staggered the Americans as much as anyone else. In response, President Roosevelt established a defensive line, 300 miles out to sea, and posted patrols. And as FDR knew the American people had no interest in joining the conflict, he had to figure out a way of helping the Allies without committing the United States. Towards that aim, parts of the Neutrality Act were repealed. Now, arms could be sold to whoever could pay cash and come and get them. The Cash and Carry Clause that appealed to American citizens and their representatives. Of course, this really just meant Britain and France, as German trade vessels were now non-existent in the Atlantic. London guessed correctly that Hitler would now not adhere to the London Submarine Accord, so convoys were organized. The first was on September 8th from Nova Scotia 
to make for either Liverpool or Plymouth, depending on how events played out. And this system worked well enough when it was followed through. But at this stage of the war, there weren't enough escort vessels. So there would be times when the convoy was unprotected or watched over by a single armed merchantman. The results are easy to predict. From September of 39 to May of 1940, U-boats sunk 229 merchantmen. Yet only 12 of these were part of convoys. When a convoy first left, it was escorted by the Canadian Navy. Then it had to travel a ways without protection. Then the British would pick it up close to their waters. However, during the last 24 hours, the convoys were practically on their own, only being protected by Coastal Command aircraft. Plenty of opportunities for the U-boats. But the German subs had their own problems, namely their torpedoes. Only after engaging a British vessel did the attackers learn of the flaw with their G-7A trackless electrical torpedoes. The weapons would often run too deep or go off on a random course or detonate too soon, not only endangering the sub, but at the very least, giving away its position. U-Boat 56 actually hit the battleship Nelson with two torpedoes, but both turned out to be duds. When word of this got back to Sub-Commander Donitz, he angrily ordered an inquiry. Turns out that no less than 30% of the torpedoes had defective contact pistols, which were to detonate when they made contact with the ship's magnetic field under the target vessel. Several ranking officers of the torpedo department were court-martialed. With limited subs at the beginning of the war, Germany only had about 10 operating at any one time, and defective torpedoes, Raider turned to another weapon, mines. Using every seagoing vessel it could get its hands on, the German Navy laid hundreds of mines along Britain's east coast in tidal estuaries. Many of these were the new magnetic mines. These did not have to make contact to explode. Merely a metal ship going by would set them off. Moreover, they could not be swept for by the usual means, as the sweeping vessels themselves would set off an explosion. The mines did what the limited subs could not. 120 merchant ships were lost during the first six months of the war. Also, 15 minesweepers were lost. The Nelson and two cruisers were put out of action for some time. The Port of London came to a standstill that winter of 1939 to 40. But then the British got a break on November 23rd of 1939. A magnetic mine was found in a tidal marsh in the Thames estuary. Once Lieutenant Commander John G. de Ouvry removed the detonator, it was a hairy business. He told the others how he was going to do it and then told them not to repeat his steps if the mine exploded. The device was taken apart to see how it worked. With this knowledge, a straightforward way was put together to counteract the magnetic mines. Electrical degaussing cables were passed around the ship's hull and then attached to its generators. With a current running through the cables, the magnetic field of the cables overpowered the magnetic field of the ship. Hence, the detonator of the mine would not be activated. The number of ships lost to magnetic mines started to decrease. Of course, this scientific approach to war didn't stir the heart of Churchill. No, he wanted the German subs, the hunters, to become the hunted. Yes, convoys had to be protected, but what the first sea lord wanted was a sea-going cavalry, groups of vessels to seek out and destroy the U-boats. To many, this brought up the saying of a needle in a haystack, but the Navy's rotund leader was not to be gainsaid. So, groups were built around the carriers Ark Royal and Courageous. As the task forces went to sea with no training and lacking the right equipment, they didn't have much to show 
for their spent fuel. Two bombers from the Ark Royal attacked Fritz Lemp's U-30, the sub that sank Athenia, but failed to seek her. But what's worse, the planes were flying too low, so the thrown-up water caused the planes to crash into the ocean. The carrier went from sub-hunter to rescuer. Not a propitious beginning. Yet Churchill wasn't the only one thinking of the offensive. In Berlin, Raider wanted to take advantage of having so many British ships stumbling around the Atlantic. His subs may not have been given permission for unrestricted warfare, with its rules that tied a sub-commander's hands behind his back, but that certainly wasn't the case against the British Royal Navy. And a daring raid, the boldest of bold enterprises, was being worked out by Donitz. He would launch an attack against the capital ships of Germany's enemy at Scapa Flow. 